Good morning. Praise God. Well, welcome back. We are glad to get going again. Man, I enjoyed the break, but I, I enjoy ministering. That's really, really good. So how many of you are new students? Could I have you, if you're a new student, could you stand up, please? Let's have you stand up. Stand up. Praise the Lord. Well, welcome. We believe this is going to be a life-changing experience for you. Praise God. It's going to be awesome. You know, I got a confession to make to you. I hate to do this, but some of you will like this. Something's wrong with you if you like this. <laughs> but you know, I've said I just do not get sick. I refuse to be sick. Well, I got sick the last two days. I had a cold. That's my third cold in 56 years. Some of you are disappointed. I'm disappointed. Some of you are excited that I got sick. That's sick. Hey, Amen. But there's some people that, you know, that just makes you feel better. If I get sick, well, then you get justified for being sick. But I believe that the Lord has put within us his power. And I don't actually know what happened. Uh, you know, we got back from Phoenix and on Sunday, man, I was just so wasted. I could hardly stand up. Matter of fact, I walked up these steps on Monday and I was out of breath. I couldn't hardly talk. And I was just worn out. And I don't know, uh, every time I've had a cold in the last 56 years, it's, cause, it's been because I pushed myself too much, but I don't know what I did that was extra. We held a, a conference in Phoenix this last weekend and on <clears throat> Saturday I was standing 10 out of 11 hours during the day and I guess, anyway, I don't know what happened, but praise God, I'm healed. But since I'm bo so bold proclaiming that, I didn't want to hide it from you and make you think that I wasn't being honest. So anyway, Praise God, I tripped, but I'm up. Praise God, I refuse to be sick. I just don't like, man, if that's the way people feel when they get sick, that's terrible. I hadn't felt that way in, I hadn't felt that way in decades. That's just rotten. Why would anybody accept something like that? Anyway, praise God, we are glad to have you back, and I believe that this is just going to be a special, special time. You know, you get out of things what you put into it, and uh, it's really based on your expectancy, and so you have to really be believing God for something, and I know that many of you have uh, already been here, you know, for a semester, but those of you that are new, I'm encouraging you that you need to really increase your expectations most people are afraid to get their hopes up because they're afraid they'll be disappointed. But man, you need your hopes up. God uses hope to move in your life in a powerful way. Let's look at these verses over in Hebrews chapter six. In Hebrews chapter six, of course, the first few verses are talking about that we need to move on beyond just the elementary things of the Lord and we need to grow into maturity because if a person ever renounces their faith, there's no uh, hope of ever getting them re, uh, born again again. You only get born again one time. And then he went on to say in verse uh, 11, and we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end that you be not slothful but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. You know, this, this is, uh, these words used in the same verse are contrary to most people. When it talks about don't be slothful and then it talks about faith and patience. Most people think patience is just, uh, you know, putting up with something, sitting there and doing nothing. They see patience as a passive thing. 
But that is not what the scripture des describes patience as. It says you can't be slothful, but you've got to have patience. Patience is actually perseverance. Patience is fighting through something, not just sitting there like, you know, waiting on a bus to come. Instead, you're like a waiter that is looking at somebody and you are waiting and looking for the slightest little indication of anything that they want you to do. And so you can't be slothful. You got to put some effort into this. And uh, <clears throat> through faith and patience, you inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself saying, surely blessing, I will bless thee and multiplying, I will multiply thee. This is in Genesis chapter 22, after Abraham had offered up Isaac and was willing to sacrifice his own son out of obedience to God, the Lord stopped him, showed him a ram that was caught in a thicket by his horns and he offered the ram. And then the Lord says, now I know that you trust me, that you truly commit to me. And so he says in blessing, I will bless you and in multiplying, I will multiply you. So that's what that's quoting. And in verse 15, it says, and so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Again, patiently endured. You know, over in Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about uh, Moses and it says that he endured as seeing him who was invisible. Most people go by that movie, the 10 commandments, and they see that Moses, you know, went out into the desert and basically they describe it that Moses doesn't want anything to do with God. He's running from God and trying to put God out of his mind. But Hebrews chapter 11, I'd have to look up the exact verse. It says he endured as seen him who is invisible. The word endure doesn't mean that you're just putting up with something. He was seeking God that entire time. And so this is talking about after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. So again, endurance is not a passive word. It's not just talking about putting up with something and just showing up. It's talking about a hard attitude. You have to put yourself into this and be not slothful. In verse uh, 16, it says, For verily men swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath, by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. So this brings two things into play. That is that God, it's impossible for God to lie. He cannot break his word. Hebrews chapter one, verse three says, he upholds all things by the word of his power. And if you really study that out, that means he holds the entire creation together through the integrity of his word. If God was to ever break his word, the whole creation would fly apart. I don't know how many of you have studied stuff like this, but you get into some of the physics stuff and they say that this pulpit right here, it looks solid to us, but the truth is it's made up of atoms and molecule and there's space in between these things. And even in an atom in the nucleus, you have negative and charged, uh, positive charged particles and you have some of those things that they should be repelling each other. And they really can't understand what it is that holds the entire creation together. And we've only found a couple of unstable atoms like uranium and plutonium that we can split. And that's where they get the atomic bomb from. But did you know that everything, I heard uh, Oral Roberts one time say that in a slice of bread, there is enough energy that you could power an ocean liner across the Atlantic and back on one slice of bread if you could unleash the power that is in that bread. But we just don't have the ability to do it. What is it that holds all of these things together? Hebrews chapter uh, uh, one, verse three, he upholds all things by the word of his power. So it's impossible for God to lie. God cannot lie. And as long as you see creation still held together, you know that God has never broken his word. And boy, this has so many applications. This is also why sometimes we don't see God intervene. People think, well, he's God. If he wanted to, he could intervene. He could just solve this problem. 
No, he couldn't because he gave you authority. He said, you resist the devil and he will flee from you. And there's all kinds of restrictions that God, in a sense, placed on himself when he gave us so much power and authority. And so God cannot lie. He cannot violate his word. You know, if you were to fall off of a building, you, you know, might think, well, God loves me. Why didn't he just suspend gravity and keep this, you know, keep me from falling and killing myself or hurting myself? But he, if he had done that for you, well, then there's thousands of people that would have flown off the road as they were driving or all kinds of other things would have happened. God established laws and he is not going to violate his laws unless it's for a really good reason and he only does it through faith. Like he, uh, you know, during Joshua's time, he had the sun stand still. Still don't know how he did that. Uh, some people just believe it's impossible, but I believe exactly what the word says. God can do anything but it's going to it's going to be very very rare that you will see God suspend the natural laws that he created. So anyway, God placed restrictions on himself. He cannot violate his own integrity. He is not going to violate his word. And then on top of that, just to show us how strong his commitment to us is, he swore by an oath and he said that oaths are what put all people's doubts uh, you know to rest. When a person says, man, I swear, well, then that increases, uh, you know, their, uh, I guess, the, the respect or the, um, what am I thinking of? Anyway, when you swear for something, people think, well, boy, you must be serious. You, you've sworn on this. So God swore, and so he, it was impossible for him to lie in the first place, but then to accommodate us, he gave us an oath. And he swore by an oath unto us, is what it says right here, so that we could have a strong uh, co consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. Hope is just something that's in the future. Hope is a positive expectation of good. Whereas you could say dread would be a negative expectation of bad or something, but hope is always a positive expectation of good. You need to be anticipating and looking for God to be doing something awesome in your life. And he will meet you where your faith is. According to your faith, so be it unto you. So you need to get your hopes up. You need to be believing for something big. And it says in verse 19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. What he's talking about is within the veil is talking about in the tabernacle or in the temple, there was, there was the uh, tabernacle and it was divided into two parts. There was a holy place and then the holy of holies and the holy of holies is where God dwelt. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. And so this says that we have a strong consolation who have uh, fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veil. This is talking about into the very holy of holies where God is. Did you know hope is what anchors you to God? And I tell you, Satan is just constantly trying to fight against our hope. You know, yesterday I did an interview on uh, radio with uh, E.W. Jackson and a lot of his people that are in his organization called Stan. And one of the things that happened, some of these ministers are just overwhelmed with all of the wokeness that's happening, all of the bad stuff that's happening, and they were discouraged. The scripture says in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus was speaking, and he said, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. If you look that up in the Greek, it actually says the love of most. That's the way it's translated in the NIV and the Amplified. And it's saying that when things are bad, what it does, it, it affects people's hope. They quit believing God. They're looking at our nation and thinking, well, what's the use? Things are getting worse instead of better. And there's a lot of people that it affects your hope. Over in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, most people don't think about this, but it says in, uh, uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. Did you know faith only gives substance, tangibility, reality to things hoped for? 
Most people will put hope in a category where they kind of push that down. And somebody will say, well, I hope that things are going to work out. And people say, you need to quit hoping and you need to believe. And they will criticize a person who's just hoping. But hope is the first step in faith. Faith gives substance to things that are hoped for. So if you don't have a strong hope, if you don't have that, you don't have a strong consolation, consolation you aren't anchored into, the veil, in, in, into that within the veil. You aren't anchored to God and you're going to have Satan blow you off course. And this is how he tries to destroy us. If we can... If we can keep our hope strong in the Lord, I guarantee you, you will see the power of God come through. But Satan is doing everything he can to try and squelch your hope. I look back in my life and boy, Jamie and I, the way that we got started, it was just, I, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. But if you live through it, it makes an awesome testimony. And we've, we've seen God do some great things, but I guarantee you there were times that there was not any proof, any evidence whatsoever that uh, God's anointing was on my life, that I was doing what God told me to do. People used to stay away from my meetings by the thousands. And I mean, here I was speaking and saying these things that God had told me and saying that we were gonna reach people all over the world. I remember in Seagaville, uh, Texas, we had uh, our largest crowd normally was 12 people. Most of the time it was five. And three of those were Jamie, myself, and our firstborn son. <laughs> and we met five times a week. And we usually had somewhere around five to seven. Our largest crowd was 12. One time we fed people and we had 20 something come if we <laughs> bribed them with food. But I mean, we gave everything we had to that. I bought mailing lists and I sent out letters to every single person in Seagaville, Texas. We did everything that we knew and I guarantee you for two years, there was just very little evidence of anything. And it was, it was warring against my hope. And you're gonna have things like this happen. What you gotta do, you gotta, when you get a word from God you need to pr put the proper value on it. You know, this man, Joe Nay, he was the one that kind of got me uh, turned on to the Lord. And the way that happened was he was just, he was a pagan. I mean, this guy, he used to go to uh, uh, parties at Christmas and New Year's where they'd swap wives and have sex with other people's wives. And he was, a, he was just a pagan. He was a drunk. He would drive 50 miles an hour and put his... Um, what do you call it, the rim of his tire up against a curb so that he could see the sparks fly. And he just was, he was weird. And <laughs> anyway, he was on the church rolls of our Baptist church. And uh, so this one guy, uh, Gene Price, went over and visited with him. And it's a long story, but he got born again. And when he got born again, he got radically, radically saved. And I mean, this guy, he would just in, in the service, hallelujah, and praise God. And he would lift his hands. Nobody did that in our Baptist church unless you needed to know where the bathroom was. You know, you'd <laughs> raise your hand or something. And so anyway, I was just 17, 18 years old. And um, man, he just seemed like an exciting guy. So we went to the church rolls, looked up where he lived and went over uh, to visit him. Told I had a friend with me. Steve and we went over and told him we were visiting from the church and wanted to see him. So he invited us in and Steve went straight to the refrigerator and looked and his wife, Joanne had just fixed him a pie for his birthday. It was his birthday. And Steve and I ate the whole pie. Didn't even give him a piece of it. And we sat there and visited with this guy. And instead of getting upset with us or something, he just started telling us about being caught up into heaven and he saw these animals, and he had been a pagan. He didn't know the word. And so he saw these animals, and he said, one of them looked like an eagle, and another one looked like an ox. And he got to describing these things. And I turned over to the book of Revelation, and I said, Joe, this is in the Bible. You are in the throne of God. He didn't know it. He didn't know what he saw. And man, this just lit a fire on the inside of me that, man, there's so much more than what I'd experienced. And so for about six months or a year, 
we went over and visited with him and he was just, he, he had a fresh look on things and it created a hope on the inside of me that there was something more. And this is what really greased the tracks. It's what created the desire on the inside of me. And then Joe was there on March the 23rd, 1968, when we actually had that experience and the Lord just showed up and man, he forever changed my life. And Joe and Steve, this other guy that was with me, they were the only two that appreciated what God had done in my life. But I mean, I had a hope instilled in me. And you know, I don't know exactly all the reasons I credit it to the Lord, but I didn't know enough to do this deliberately. It was just God that supernaturally blessed me. But um, I always valued what God did. And my hope, I, I knew the next morning after we had that encounter with the Lord, I went up to the church and Steve, this friend of mine, he was a church janitor. And I went to him and I said, I don't know how or what's going to happen, but I'm going to be traveling the world. I'm going to be telling people about God. And I had this hope placed on the inside of me and I nurtured it. And it kept me anchored to the Lord, even when I couldn't see it in my actions. And then, you know, many years later, it's a long story, but Joe got mad at me because the guy who ordained me to the ministry was Joe's mortal enemy. And so Joe just uh, rejected me over <coughs> my association with this other guy. And then Joe wound up committing adultery and some bad things happened. And uh, so anyway, this has been 12 years or something since I'd seen Joe. And I just got to praying for him and Joanne. And I really felt compelled to uh, connect with them. And so I tried calling and their phone was disconnected. I didn't know how to get a hold of them, but I knew that Joanne's maiden name was Wilson, and I knew that she lived in Longview, Texas, is where she grew up, and I'd met her parents one time. So I went and got a phone book. For those of you that don't know what a phone book is, I got a phone book, and I started calling every Wilson in Longview, Texas. There was hundreds of them. And I started calling everyone and finally I came and I called and Joanne answered the phone. She was at her parents' house. And I said, Joanne, this is Andrew Womack. And she hung up on me. <laughs> and man, I thought, well, I know I was supposed to do this. I don't understand what happened. And I was just sitting at that phone praying and saying, God, what am I supposed to do? And in just a few minutes, Joanne called back and she says, I'm sorry I hung up on you, but she says, you're the last person I thought that God would use. But she said, Joe, she's, she's the one that told me that Joe had committed adultery, that they'd lost their church that they were pastoring and uh, people had turned on Joe and he was in a meeting where there was like a thousand ministers and they stood him up and rebuked him openly. And he got so mad at God that he just said, man, if this is the way Christians are, I want nothing to do with it. And so he, he walked away and he was back to selling paper. And they had lost their home and they had lost everything and they were just in a mess. And Joanne was praying and saying, God, I know we, we don't have our phone number anymore. We've lost our home. I don't know how people could find us, but you're God. You could make anybody call. I'll take anybody. And she was praying. And right as she prayed, that is when I called. And so she told me all of this and she said, would you please talk to <coughs> Joe when he gets home? He gets off work at five o'clock. And so I said, I'll call back. And so anyway, I called at five. And for those of you that don't know about phones that used to be attached to the wall, <laughs> you could take the phone off of the hook and it would have a busy signal. And it would be like you were talking on the phone and nobody could come through. So anyway, I started calling, but I got a busy signal and I call from five o'clock until 12 midnight, every 10 minutes, every 10 minutes I called and Joe didn't want to talk to me. And so finally at 12, I guess he figured I'd give up. And so he put the phone back on the hook. And as soon as he did, I called and uh, he started complaining. And anyway, it's a long story, but God put us back together I was able to get Joe back into the ministry and man, he went out with a shout. I got to do his funeral in 2020. He was 20 years older than me. And uh, anyway, the reason for bringing all of this up is that when 
we went to Phoenix and held a meeting together. I was just so excited to be with Joe. And during the day, we'd drive around and we went out to Tortilla Flats, if any of you know where that is. And we just had a great time. And the whole time I was just talking about, man, do you remember that time that we were talking about Pentecost and the wind came through and the curtain stood out straight and yet a little candle on the table never even flickered. And I said, man, we, we saw miracles. And I was just talking about all of the things we saw. I was talking about him going up into heaven and seeing these animals and things like this. And finally, I mean, he just, he just yelled at me and says, stop it. And I said, stop what? And he said, I don't remember any of this stuff. He didn't remember being caught up into heaven. He had forgotten that. He had forgotten all of these things that I was talking about because of life had gotten his attention off of the Lord and he had lost his hope. And that's why he got into the problems that he got into. So I'm telling you, this is one of the important things. You need to have a godly hope, not just come up with your own hope, come up with your own goals and desires and say, this is what I want. You need to seek the Lord and ask him, God, what do you want to accomplish in my life while I'm here? And you need to have God paint a picture and you need to see that and then faith will give substance to things that are hoped for. But if there's zero hope, well then faith won't bring any substance to it. You know, I've used this example before, but uh, Charles Capps told about a man that was, you know, living out in the woods and he only came into town once every four or five years and he came into town and went to a church service and there was thousands of people in this church. It was beginning to get hot and he saw an usher come up and touch this little thing on the wall and turn it. And in just a minute or two, he started feeling cold air. And it cooled off the whole thing. And he was so impressed with that that he went up to this usher afterwards and he says, what did you do? And he didn't understand it first. And he described it to him. He says, oh, well, that's a thermostat. And he says, you can just turn that and this cold air will come on. And he said, yeah. And he says, where do you get one of those? And he said, well, you get them at a hardware store. So this guy goes and buys a thermostat and puts it on his wall out in his shack. And when it starts getting hot, he turns that thing. But of course, no cold air comes. Did you know that the thermostat is not the power unit, but it activates the power unit. And that's what hope and faith is. Hope is what activates your faith. And your hope is an important part of what God does in your life. And so again, the world is going to try and just take away your hope. Those of you that are brand new will come in. You know, it's not going to be all uh, positive things that happen here. You may have a hard time getting a place to live, a job or, or whatever. There'll be things that happen and Satan will try and get your attention off of things. And you have to keep that hope. It's like an anchor that goes right into the very presence of God and it keeps you anchored to God. And I can truthfully say in my life that this is what kept me from giving up for, I bet you for at least 15 or 20 years, there was very little evidence of God working in my life. There was some, but I even had my father-in-law come to me one time after he got to where he had talked to me. <laughs> we started off pretty rough. But after he got to where he kind of liked me, he came and he says, you're a nice guy. And he says, but you know what? It's not working. You need to go do something else. And the fact that he thought he was trying to help me made it even worse. He wasn't saying it out of rejection or out of bitterness. He just thought, boy, it's not working. You need to go do something else. And the thing that kept me from quitting and giving up is that hope. It was an anchor. And it anchored me to what God had told me. And that's the reason Joe wound up having some of the problems that he had. This is why all, you know, if the Israelites had remembered all of the great things that God did in the land of Egypt, they wouldn't have just complained and said, we wished we'd have died over here. They, they were looking at the worst case scenario. Instead of seeing the promised land and all the good things God had for them, they saw the hardships of the wilderness. Praise God, you need to have a strong hope that will anchor you to the things of God. And if you'll do that, I guarantee you, faith will provide substance for what you hope for. It'll bring it into physical manifestation. Amen. So get your hopes up.
Believe God for something big and I guarantee you, God will not disappoint you. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.